We've been engaged in a series since uh, the beginning of summer called Joy and Laughter. You never can have too much. You can only have too little. And uh, we've spent most of our time up till now looking at the laughter side. We have been looking at passages out of the book of Proverbs, such things like laughter is good medicine for the soul. It's not the only verse, but it's the uh, key verse that we've used up till now to look at the idea that those of us who say we're Christians, uh, I don't think we laugh near enough, all right? Somehow when we got saved, our funny bone got removed from us. And uh, we need it to be uh, reactivated again in our lives. Um, today, we're going to look at more of the, begin to look more at the joy side. Now, joy is the foundation for laughter. Laughter without joy is really false humor. And so, what we need to experience in our lives is this fundamental foundation of joy that God says is a gift to us. And then it will find expressions at any moment, at any time with laughter. We shouldn't be laughing all the time, but we should be prepared to laugh at any time. We took a, a little break from the laughter as we bridged to this joy because there are times in church life you need to deal with what's going on in the life of your family. Uh, just as at home, you have to make adjustments sometimes in your home budget because of needs or circumstances, and you need to take time to address that. Sometimes there are health challenges in your family, and you've got to break your normal routine of, of everyday life and experience and work because you need to address what's going on health-wise in your family. The same thing is true for us as a church fellowship. We're family. And um, there, are, there are always needs. We're never without needs in our church. But there are occasions in which those needs sort of hit such a magnitude. You, you, you got to pause and address those things. And we've done that the last two weeks with Augustina's unexpected, and very untimely death for all of us. A uh, quick update on Steve. I, kinda, I expect him to be in the next service. Uh, that's his intent anyway. Um, he was here last Sunday, just a few days after his wife's memorial service. As you know, she was 31 years old. They'd been married less than eight months, and she's now in heaven. And um, last Sunday, these first three rows in the 11 o'clock service were filled by Steve and friends of his who are not normally in church. And the 915 last week, sitting up here with Shelley on the front row, was Augustina's sister and husband and members of their family and close friends. And um, Steve, um, Steve and I met the week of the memorial service along with Brandon, and we had lunch together, and we just talked about there's going to be a lot of firsts over the next several months, lots of firsts for him. And there's not a time schedule, and there's not an, uh, uh, an exact order, but there are some things he'll need to begin to make decisions about. One, a decision when to return to his own home. And he chose to do that last Sunday evening. Uh, his and Augustine is home, and it's in a stage of remodel work. And so there are decisions he's going to need to make about that. And folks, many in the church have stepped to the plate and said, we'll help you, we'll do that remodel for you. And so he'll need to make decisions about that. Well, he made the first big decision, that was to go home. And, and then he made the decision as... She, I mean, yes, that body he has is 80% natural. I hate him. Um, but it's kept in that fine condition that it's in because he works out regularly. Well, he chose to go back to a different club than he and Augustina worked out in together. But he chose to go back to, to just to exercise. And uh, then he's made the decision that tomorrow he'll go back to the job. He'll go back to work. Uh, so each of these are first steps, and there are others that will be down the road that he has to make. Um, we don't want this. This can't be just a two-week and done, okay? This is an ongoing where we check in, we check on him, we invite him to do things, and, and um, thank you for your kindness. Thank you for your availability to care for him. Um, I'm, I'm going to pause, and I... I Probably should have asked him for permission first. 
Um, Dan sitting over here at my left. That's Dan's door. He guards that door for me. He's got my back every Sunday that he's here. As you know, Dan is battling cancer. Uh, and I haven't talked about it in a while because I don't. And I had a great evening with him the other night. And we set out and um, enjoyed the beautiful weather and enjoyed a wonderful visit. And yet we didn't talk one thing about your cancer, did we? Not one thing. Did it mean that it wasn't on our minds a bit? No. We still trust God, but we don't always have to talk about the problem, the challenge, the difficulty we face when we're together. It's true with Steve. It's, it's true with Dan and his family. Um, I watched, you didn't know, but I was checking you out. Um, your, your attitude, all right, yeah, not the body, your attitude, all right. <laughs> um, I, I watched Dan just kick back and laugh as we sat out there and visited and talked. And that tells me that where he is in the process and, and treatment is going well, and we're grateful for that. It's still a battle. But he's allowed God to develop in him that willingness to laugh at any moment. Not every moment is a laughing matter, but it hasn't stolen his joy. And I'm so excited about that. And that's a subject that we are going to delve into today. Let's do that right now. I invite you to turn to Philippians chapter 4. We'll be reading from there in a few minutes. Years ago, an author by the name of Robert Fulgham, he wrote a profound essay. Many of you have probably read portions of it or uh, you've read others quote portions of it. Here's how he began that essay. He said, most of what I really need to know about how to live, I learned in kindergarten. He goes on to say, wisdom was not at the top of the graduate school mountain, but it was right there in the sandbox at nursery school. There are things I learned, things like share everything, play fair, don't hit people, put things back where you found them, clean up your own mess, don't take things that aren't yours, say you're sorry when you hurt somebody, wash your hands before you eat, flush warm cookies, let me say that differently. <laughs> Flush, period. Warm cookies and cold milk are good for you. When you go out in the world, watch for traffic. Hold hands. Stick together. May I add one that my mother taught me? When you go out, wear clean underwear. I think Fulgham, to a great extent, was very right about his observations. Most of what we need to know about living, we really did learn when we were young. But one lesson that's not learned in kindergarten, in fact, it's not learned by most people their entire life, is how to be content. This is unfortunate because contentment is the key to a joy-filled life. I want to focus today and next Sunday on what it means to be content. If you've been around here very long, you've heard me preach very many times, you will know that my favorite verse in the Bible is the verse we're going to be dealing with today. I have learned to be content in whatever situation, state, circumstance I find myself in. When have you asked somebody, hey, how you doing? And the first answer to your question was, man, I'm content. When does somebody ask you the question of how you are? And when was it just second nature for you to say, I'm content? We usually say, I'm fine, thank you very much. And we go on and, and you don't really meant what you say and they didn't hear what you said to the question they ask. They're just rote responses. But Paul wants us to address this at a deeper level. Remember the milk commercial? Got milk? I want to tweak the question today. Got joy? It's a question I hope you'll ask yourself. I once read of a little boy who used to escape his bedroom after he was disciplined. He would crawl out of his bedroom window down an old fruit tree to the ground one day his father told him he was going to chop down that fruit tree because it hadn't produced any fruit in several years. That evening, the boy and his best friend went out, bought a bushel of apples, and they hung them on the tree that night. 
The next morning when the man went out and saw the apples hanging from the tree, he couldn't believe his eyes. He went back in the house and he said to his wife, Honey, I can't believe it. That old tree hasn't yielded fruit for years and now it's covered with apples. And the most amazing thing is, it's a pear tree. (laughs) What I want to suggest to you today is, is that uncharacteristic fruit can begin to be produced in your life. If you are frequently more discontent than you are content, if you have a tendency to be sad more than you are happy, if you have a perspective that is more negative than it is positive, God can produce uncharacteristic fruit in your life. Because what is not uncharacteristic to him is love, joy, peace, goodness, kindness, the fruit of the Spirit, which he said, I'll produce in your life if you give me permission. In the regions of Mexico, there's a few places where hot springs and cold springs are found side by side. And because of this convenience of this natural phenomenon, the women in that area would bring their laundry and they would boil their clothes in the hot springs and then they would rinse them in the cold springs. A tourist who was watching this procedure commented to his Hispanic guide and said, they must think that Mother Nature is generous to freely supply such ample hot and cold water. And the guide replied, no, senor. There is much grumbling because she does not supply the soap. (laughs) Sounds an awful lot like Americans, doesn't it? You have this great sense of generosity, and yet you find one thing to complain about. Contentment is this wonderful virtue that God makes available to us. But as Paul says, he had to learn it. It comes from being rightly related to God and trusting in his love for your life unconditionally. Many folks, me included, we've tried to find contentment much like we have love at times in all the wrong places. We try to find it in amassing a large amount of money. We try to find it in the purchase of a lot of possessions. We try to to find it in the wielding of power and influence on others. We try to find it by having prestige and honor. We try to find it through relationships or jobs. But what we've discovered in our society today is all those things, as good as they may be at times for us, leave us still empty and discontent. I love the definition of contentment that was written by a Puritan author named Jeremiah Burroughs when he said, Christian contentment is that sweet, inward, quiet, gracious frame of spirit which freely submits and delights in God's wise and fatherly disposal of every condition in our life. See, what contentment is, is a little bit of what we talked about last week. It is being at peace with what God has permitted to happen in our life. It's to be at rest in every situation. Follow along with me and let's read the book of Philippians chapter 4, verses 10 through 20. Paul says, I rejoice greatly in the Lord that you've had opportunity to renew your concern for me. You had no opportunity to show it before. I'm not saying this because I am in need, for I have what? Learn to be content, whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in each and every situation. Whether I'm well-fed or hungry, whether I'm living in plenty or in want, I can do everything through him who is my strength. Yet it was good of you to share in my troubles. May I suggest to you it's good of you to share in each other's troubles. Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out from Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving. Paul said, when I stepped out as a missionary, nobody was helping except for you. You at Philippi, you helped me. Even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid again and again when I was in need. Not that I'm looking for a gift now, but I'm looking for what may be credited to your account. I have received full payment and more. I am amply supplied. Let me pause right here. 
He's under house arrest. While he's under house arrest, he's chained to a guard in another room. He only gets what the guards fix him to eat. He's confined like a prisoner in his jail cell. He said, I've received from Epaphrodites the gifts that you sent. They're a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice. They're pleasing to God. And my God will meet your needs according to his glorious riches, riches in Jesus Christ. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. You see, the Bible has a lot to say about contentment. John the Baptist told some soldiers to be content with their wages in Luke chapter 3. Paul wrote to a young preacher by the name of Timothy in the first book of Timothy where he says, But godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into this world and we can take nothing out of it. You might have your family spend a lot of money on the casket that you're buried in, but guess what? You won't enjoy it one bit more than the cheapest they could have purchased. Now, by that, I'm not telling you go out and buy the cheapest there is, all right? But you won't know the difference. I'm reminded of the story of the self-made millionaire who, uh, in front of three of his best friends, he made his wife promise that she would pack his million dollars in the casket with him when he died. So, time went by and he died. The three friends showed up at the, um, at the funeral home and they walked up to look in on their friend. He was in his best suit. They felt around the casket and they couldn't feel the money. The three of them went straight to the wife who was there for the viewing and confronted her and said, hey, we were there. You promised your husband that you would bury his million dollars with him. She said, I did. She said, no, you didn't. We've looked all through that casket. She said, the check's in his pocket in his suit coat. We can't take it with us. No matter what form or fashion it's in, we can't take it with us. This is repeated by the author who wrote the book of Hebrews when in chapter 13, verse 5, he said, keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have. But even though we're frequently told to be content in Scripture, very few Christ believers actually experience that quality of contentment that Paul is talking about. As Paul wraps up his letter, he expresses his deep gratitude. As the founding pastor of that church in the city of Philippi, Paul had a special relationship with those folks. The church had supported his ministry in the past, and recently they had sent another gift. The passage we're looking at today and next week is Paul's thank you note. But as we look underneath the surface at what he writes, we discover a man who was utterly content. So what we're going to attempt to do today and next week is look through the lens of Paul's life and consider five important keys to contentment. Here's the first one. We need to learn to relax in God's sufficiency. Look again at verse 10. Ten years had passed since Paul's ministry in Philippi. Right after he left the church, the Philippians had sent Paul financial support. But even though they continued to be concerned, they apparently weren't able to help for a long period of time. We're not told why they couldn't. Maybe they didn't know where Paul was. But most recently, Epaphroditus arrived in Rome bringing a very generous gift. And because of this, Paul says in verse 10, I've rejoiced in the Lord greatly. I want us to notice Paul's gracious attitude regarding the time when he didn't receive anything from the Philippians. He doesn't scold them for not sending anything in support. He didn't get worked up over it. No panic in his voice. How could Paul remain content in the face of the absence of these things? He was content because he knew the sufficiency for his daily needs was not found in what others could do, but in what Christ had promised. So we see... Earlier in chapter 1, if we took the time to read it today in the book of Philippians, that even though Paul was chained to a Roman guard, he still rejoiced because God used those negative circumstances to advance the purpose and the cause of Christ because the jailer and his entire family got saved because Paul had been a prisoner under Roman guard. Paul said, all things work together for good. Even my imprisonment, God has used for an incredible purpose. As I thought about this week, 
I thought about Steve sitting right there in the 11 o'clock service last week and three rows of friends lined up there. God will not waste Augustina's untimely death. Doesn't mean that God is the cause of her death. But God said, if in the midst of your tragedies, you will depend upon me, you will trust me with what you can't see today, but you will trust me that I keep my word to you, that I won't waste anything, good, bad, or indifferent in your life. We will see good come from it. We need to learn to relax in God's sufficiency. This is foundational to contentment. Just think how much stomach acid you would avoid if you stopped trying to control people or manipulate your circumstances. Many of you know what it's like to wake up at night fretting about how you convince somebody to give you your way or how we can twist things so they turn out the way we want it to. But instead of doing those things, we need to learn to sit back, relax, trust God's sufficiency. Surely we'd live much more contented lives if we did that. Worry is one of our greatest joy thieves. Instead of allowing worry to consume us, Paul says in verse 6, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. In other words, don't worry about anything, but pray about everything. Let God be God. Relax in his sufficiency. Don't carry on your shoulders the weight that God is willing to carry on his. Jesus said, who of you by worry can add a single hour to your life? Quite frankly, folks, by worry, you will take hours off your life. Worry doesn't help anything. So the first key to contentment is to relax in God's sufficiency. The second key to con contentment is to rest in what God provides. Look again at verse 11. Doesn't that verse blow you away? Remember, Paul was under house arrest, chained to a Roman soldier, living on a sparse diet, but none of those circumstances affected his contentment. He had learned in whatever the circumstances. Underline that phrase in your Bible so you'll be reminded of it again. This is almost impossible for us to grasp in the 21st century culture of America. You see, nothing in our society encourages us to be content with what we have. Think about every commercial you see on TV. It's creating a sense of dissatisfaction so that you want what it is that they are advertising. Sometimes I feel like we're being carried along by a raging river that screams at us, buy more, get more, do more. A doctor by the name of Matthew Sleeth wrote a very provocative book entitled Serve God, Save the Planet. You might think it's a big Greenpeace book, and it really is a book about peace, but a different kind of peace than you would imagine. Dr. Sleeth was a former ER doctor and a chief of medical staff at a prominent hospital in the Northeast. He writes about a colleague named Todd, and as he tells Todd's story, I think it represents the way many of us Americans, even American Christians, think, even though most of us might not be able to live it out quite like Todd did. Here's Todd's story. After Todd began his medical residency, he and his wife began searching for the perfect home on the East Coast, right on the beach. They looked for a year and a half, during which time Todd began to pick up more and more shifts. Sometimes he would finish a 24-hour shift at one hospital, dash over to a second hospital for another 24-hour shift. All this so he could ramp up his salary so he could qualify for a bigger mortgage when they found their perfect home. Finally, they found that perfect home located at the end of a peninsula with a great view of the ocean and a deep water dock. There was just one problem. According to Todd, the house itself was a mess. Location was perfect. So they consulted an architect who was able to salvage part of the garage but otherwise designed a whole new dream home. Todd worked more and more hours to offset the skyrocketing construction costs. In January, he was so exhausted and spent, the family was arguing so frequently, they threw caution to the wind, and they went on a lavish tropical vacation paid for on their credit card. By spring, the house was finally complete. But one day, Todd came to work in a rage. His wife had gone on a shopping spree and spent over $25,000 on curtains, rugs, and furniture. I mean, after all, they had built this house too big for their old furniture, she explained. In retaliation, Todd went to a boat dealer. 
He said, no sense living right on the water if we don't own a boat. The boat dealer sold him not only a boat, but two jet skis as well. No problem, no payments due till winter. When Todd hauled his new boat home using his wife's minivan, he burned out the transmission. So he bought a large SUV with a towing package and leather seats. When they arrived home, they were chagrined to realize that the one part of the old house they saved, the garage, was not big enough now for the SUV. So the architect and builders returned, and in a matter of weeks, the garage was rebuilt. Just two weeks after that, Todd and his wife filed for divorce. Now, the details might be different in your case, but the same basic story is repeated time and time again. Listen to me. It is insanity to live like that. It's insanity to live beyond our means, buying things we don't really need, to impress people who don't really care with money that we really don't have. I recently reread Dave Ramsey's book, A Total Money Makeover, and the book reiterates an incredible principle that I believe is biblical. All of us need to get out of foolish debt and stay out of it. But the only way to do that is to stop living beyond our means financially, emotionally, relationally. And to do that, we must learn to rest in what it is that God has provided for us here and now. Another way to say this is we need to allow God, I didn't, I didn't originate this, but I, I like this quote. It's memorable. We need to allow God to circumcise our wanter. We need him to circumcise our wanter. Paul was not content because he was sitting on a Caribbean beach sipping a pina colada. He was content, chained to a Roman soldier, eating stale bread and gruel. Why? Because he allowed God to circumcise his wanter. He rested in what God had provided at that moment. He had Christ in his life, and that was enough. Have you done that? When was the last time you rested in what God provided? Scripture says, but if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. 1 Timothy 6, 8. Well, all of you obviously are here today. You look like you were fed today. If not, your stomach's growling. You want me to hurry up and finish so you can go have breakfast. And I'm really glad that all of you came clothed today. All right? That makes me more content. I love the way this principle is expressed in Psalm 16, 6. The boundary lies have fallen for me in pleasant places. Surely I have a delightful inheritance. God assigns each of us different boundary lines. We have different gifts and skill sets and backgrounds and experiences. God will apportion to some of us more challenges and to some of us more opportunities. The key to contentment is not looking to see what the Joneses may or may not have, but it's looking to God and trusting what he knows is best for each of us at this moment in life. The first key to contentment is relax in God's sufficiency. The second is rest in what God provides. And let me wrap up the third one, and we'll look at the other two next week. The third key is refuse to let circumstances dictate your joy. Look again at verse 12. Paul expands on what he says in the previous verse. Two times he repeats the phrase, I know, I know. In order to know what's in here, what do you have to do? <laughs> you got to read it. You got to read it and know it and let God bring it to your remembrance so that you can put it to use in the circumstances that you're facing in life. And Paul says it twice. I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. And he repeats this to emphasize that by experience, he has learned to live above his circumstances. We need to live above our circumstances, but in our means. Paul has learned to get off the roller coaster of feeling content only when things are going well and feeling lousy when things are bad. I'm sure you've ridden that ride several times, haven't you? Notice Paul learned to be content in all situations. Think about that as it relates to your own life. If Paul has food, he's content. If he's hungry, he's still content. He learned to live with contentment in all circumstances. Learn the joy of delayed gratification. Learn to eat at the best times in the healthiest way. Don't allow worry to be the driver for your eating. Allow need to be there. Learn to wait to buy when you can pay for it. Learn that giving is better than receiving. Learn that faith is better than fear. Learn not to let circumstances dictate your joy. You might consider trying this with something that you're struggling with right now. For example, if you have a tendency to get very irritable when you can't go buy something you want, why don't you say for a month, I'm going to take a want fast? 
I'm not going to buy one thing for a whole month that I want. I'm going to learn I don't have to be controlled by the need to buy something that I want. Even if I can afford it, I'm going to withhold from it. Or if you tend to be a complainer. Now, if you're a complainer, you probably don't think you are. So ask your family, okay? And then family, be honest. It's your chance, all right? I'm giving you a chance. If you tend to complain when you don't get your way, why don't you choose to fast from getting your way for two weeks? Give in to everybody else around you. Just see what a, give up the right to get your own way in order to train yourself to be content in those circumstances. Paul said he learned this in any and every situation. The problem for us is we often don't even try to learn contentment. We may train our bodies in the gym. Well, y'all might train your body. I didn't get this in a gym, trust me, all right? We may train ourselves to lose weight by going on diets. We may train ourselves to think more by reading, but we never consider teaching ourselves biblically to be content. A huge part of this retraining our mind is to think God-honoring thoughts even when our circumstances are negative. That's the reason we have to read this during the good days so we're prepared during the tough days. We can't always choose what happens to us, but we can choose our attitude. Remember, we talked about this about four or five weeks ago. Our attitude needs to be biblically directed, Holy Spirit-focused, faith-based driven. And the only way that can happen is if we're in the context of a relationship with God and the reading of his truth. Philippians 4.8 is a good verse for us to memorize. If you have your Bible still open, turn to it. I want you to read it with me, all right? I'm going to give you a chance to open it back up if you close it. Philippians 4.8. I'm going to quote it real quick, and then we're going to read it together. Finally, brothers, and that means sisters. So I would read it this way. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about these things. Highlight that verse in your Bible, but let's read it together right now, all right? Are you ready? One, two, three. Three, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, if anything, think about such things. You see, thinking these thoughts goes a long ways towards not allowing circumstances to dictate the joy that God has promised to us. So those are the first three of the five things that Paul teaches us here. Let me wrap this up. Here's how one couple learned a valuable lesson about contentment. Here's their story. They said an old man showed up at the back door of our house that we were renting. Opening the door just a few cautious inches, we saw his eyes were glassy and his furrowed face glistened with silver stubble. He clutched a wicker basket holding a few rather unappealing vegetables. He bid us a good morning and he offered to sell us some produce. We were uneasy enough that we made a quick purchase to alleviate both our pity and our fear. To our chagrin, he returned the next week. He introduced himself as Mr. Roth, the man who lived in the shack at the end of the road. As our fear subsided over the weeks, we got close enough to realize that it wasn't alcohol abuse, but cataracts that had marbleized his eyes. On subsequent visits, he would shuffle in wearing two mismatched right shoes. He would pull out his harmonica. And with glazed eyes set on a future glory, he would puff out an old gospel tune about heaven. And then he would tell us about his vegetables and his faith. On one visit, he said, the Lord is so good. I came out of my shack this morning and I found a bag full of shoes and clothing on my porch. It's just wonderful, Mr. Roth, we told him. And we're happy for you. And he then said to them, you know what's even more wonderful? Just yesterday, I met some people that could use those shoes and clothes. <laughs> A man content with where he was. Are you content? You got joy that brings contentment. Right where you are today, right now, in the circumstances you're going through. If you're still trying to figure it out, make sure you're back next week as we look at the last two principles out of this passage 
that teach us how to be content. Relax in God's sufficiency. Rest in what God provides. And refuse to let circumstances dictate your joy. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, thanks for the life of your Son, the Lord Jesus, you give to us. Thanks for the valuable truths you want to teach us in your word. And those are not only truths for us to memorize, but those are principles for us to live by. Father, thank you for the challenge you've given to us today about contentment. May we begin to learn the lesson well. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a great day.